Hi, it's Katrina. Did ancient people leave behind secret knowledge? Did they know things that we don't? Even with all of our technology and science and now even AI, there are many things that we still don't understand about the past. Here are some of the biggest mysteries of the ancient world. The Emerald Tablets of Thoth the emerald tablets are said to be made of actual emerald and hold the secrets to the universe itself. No one knows where it came from, so it's surrounded by legends. It's believed that whoever has the emerald tablets in their possession has unimaginable power. The tablets are covered in ancient esoteric texts that have intrigued philosophers and practitioners of the occult for centuries. But are they real and were they written by a god? According to the myth, it was Hermes Trismegistus who wrote the magical tablets on pure emerald. Hermes was no god, but rather a mortal figure who supposedly lived over 2,000 years ago. Hermes has been associated with the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. His association with the two gods caused some issues in the ancient world, resulting in Hermes and Thoth morphing into a single deity during the Ptolemaic era of Egypt. This was after Alexander the Great, when Egypt was ruled by the descendants of his Macedonian generals. Hermes Trismegistus may have existed or he may not have existed. He isn't as extensively documented as someone like Jesus Christ, but he does appear in texts around the world. He is in both Christian and Muslim writings, making it seem as if he truly was a living person. It's believed he wrote a book known as the Hermetica, which was essentially the Hermetic Bible. Perhaps a similar explanation is to say that Hermes created Hermeticism, a sort of offshoot religion that focused on philosophical ideas and alchemical secrets. The Hermetica is definitely real. The text became hugely popular in the Middle Ages and even had a boost of popularity in the Renaissance. The most influential astrologers of the day were inspired by the esoteric writings of a man thought to be part god. During the Renaissance, people started thinking that Hermes Trismegistus was Moses. At this point, just about every mythical figure was being connected to Hermes. Figures like Zoroaster from Persia and Fushi from China and even Enoch from the Bible. I have to stop here just for a second to speculate what the world could look like today if Hermeticism had continued. People were truly becoming obsessed with mysticism as a religion and a way of life. But by the 17th century, Hermetic writings had become outlawed by the Christian church. Yet again, the fate of the world was changed. The Vatican banned Hermetic ideas, resulting in a total collapse of the belief system. Just like how Christianity destroyed Gnosticism, Mithraism, and other fascinating beliefs that revolved around magic, Hermeticism went to its grave. It's kind of a shame though, because what if? What if people today still studied the old magical texts? What if they were allowed to openly practice the sorts of esotericism encouraged by Hermes' writing? The world would be a very different place. As for the legendary emerald tablets, they've never been found. There are so many rumors about the tablets that it's tough to discern myth from truth. It's been said they were carved in Atlantis, or that they were made by Thoth, the Egyptian god of magic. Many believe Thoth was a real living wizard whom the Egyptians turned into a god. The emerald tablets were his final works explaining the intricacies of the universe. The Nibelungs the Nibelungs are an ancient race of either dwarves or elves or maybe giants. Oh wait, you've never heard of the Nibelungs before? Let me start over. Germany, and indeed the whole Germanic area of Europe, is home to incredible myths and legends that very few people know about today. Surely you know a few Viking legends, like the gods Odin and Thor and the Arabic myth of genies, but few are familiar with the Germanic legend of the Nibelungenlied. The story of the Nibelungs was written down about 800 years ago, though it was probably passed down from generation to generation way before that. The story revolves around a mighty prince and a race of mysterious creatures that may have really existed. Prince Siegfried stumbled upon a group of horrible creatures called the Nibelung on one of his adventures. They were a race of clever, greedy, and surprisingly vicious dwarves or giants. Whether they were unusually small or ridiculously big 
depends on which version of the legend you want to believe. Big or small, the legends all agree that the Nibelungs were collectors of great wealth. Siegfried, a descendant of the Old Norse, tried to take the treasure from the creatures and was brutally murdered for it. But I mean, what did he expect to happen? You can't just walk into a dwarf or a giant lair and pillage their treasure without facing consequences. After the hero was killed, the Nibelung went on with their business. Then, around the 4th century, they were destroyed by Attila the Hun. It sounds like just another fairy tale dreamed up by medieval Germans. But what if it's not? The tale is also told in Iceland and was a favorite of the Norse in Europe. The term Nibelung appears in some rather unexpected places, including in a Latin poem written around the year 920. Scholars can't decide if the Nibelung were true mythical beings eradicated by the Huns, or maybe they were a northern civilization that's been totally overlooked by scientists. And now for number nine, but first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to John Stamos and Toy Ebot Moose Bow for supporting this channel. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about mysteries of the ancient world. Pakal the Starman Did the famous Maya ruler Pakal go to space? Some consider him the original Starman. If you ask this question to an archaeologist, they would most likely laugh in your face. But here, there is no question too outrageous for me to answer. I think maybe Pakal did go to space. Actually, I'm just kidding, probably not, but I'm going to tell you why some people think so. But first, I need to give you more details about who Pakal was. He was an exceptional man, king of Palenque during the middle part of the 7th century AD. Palenque is currently an impressive tourist site in Mexico's Chiapas state, made of crumbling ruins and forgotten artifacts. But 1,400 years ago, Palenque was called Bacal. When Kinich Janab Pakal became king, he lifted the city from obscurity into the spotlight. The jungle metropolis quickly became one of the greatest powers the Maya world ever saw. Pakal accomplished the transformation by investing in public projects. He commissioned great temples to be built throughout the city, boosting morale and attracting new citizens. It was an impressive decision to make for a 12-year-old. Spoiler alert, Pakal was 12 when he ascended the throne in 615. If you became king or queen at 12, what would your first decree be? Surely something to do with candy, I would think. Anyway, Pakal began his rule as a child and maintained it until his death at the age of 80. The Romans could have really learned something from Pakal. Roman emperors often didn't last much longer than their dinner. But Pakal ruled his whole life. He was also married to one woman, Lady Takbu Ahau. Upon his death, Pakal was buried in a mausoleum beneath the jungle floor. On his sarcophagus, there was an image of Pakal blasting off to space in a rocket. Whoa, this went from 0 to 100 in half a sentence, but it's the truth. On his sarcophagus is what appears to be Pakal sitting at the controls of a spaceship. Conspiracy theorists have cited his sarcophagus lid as proof that the Maya were in contact with space aliens. Perhaps Pakal was such a good and strong human leader that the aliens decided to bring him with them on their intergalactic travels. Maybe Pakal ascended to the heavens just like Enoch or Jesus Christ from the Bible. Or maybe none of that is true. Experts in the ancient Maya culture believe the image shows something completely different. Pakal isn't in a spaceship, but embedded in a scene of Maya mythology. The world tree is behind him, along with the celestial bird. You can see the cosmic double-headed serpent beneath Pakal as a symbol of the underworld. What do you think about Pakal? Let me know in the comments below. The Monoliths of Meghalaya Outside of India, few have heard of the monoliths of Meghalaya, yet they are considered some of the most baffling constructs in the world. Even just looking at a few images, you can tell right away the monoliths are weirder than Stonehenge. There are hundreds of standing stones spread across the site, and nobody has a clue where they came from or what they were used for. Up until about 10 years ago, even people in India didn't know about the monoliths. The entire state of Meghalaya was considered too remote to be traveling to. But with a rapid change in the economy, Meghalaya has become one of the most coveted vacation destinations in the nation. It went from being virtually untouched to causing traffic jams every afternoon. 
The giant monolithic stones were carved from single hunks of granite, shaped into vertical pillars and horizontal slabs. There isn't just one site in the state where they can be found. They are all over the place, concentrated in fields, spread across jungles, and left in ruins on the sides of random hills. The tallest of the monoliths is over 25 feet tall. Local legend claims it was a giant responsible for setting up the stones as his own rocky playground. But what really happened? There are absolutely zero records of the megaliths anywhere in India. Experts such as Dr. Vinay Kumar from Banaras Hindu University believe the stones were gathered during the Jaintiapur kingdom. The kingdom stretched across the hills of Meghalaya into Bangladesh 500 years ago. It existed until around 1835, when the British arrived and banished the Jaintia king into exile. Dr. Kumar believes the Jaintia people built the stones in commemoration of the dead. They either served as tombs or as humongous grave markers. But if that's true, where are the bodies? And why are some of the stones vertical towers and the other ones are horizontal slabs? It's another question without a reliable answer. Tour guide Samuel Sawain tells visitors that the vertical monoliths were gravestones for men, while the horizontal ones were gravestones for women. But without any physical records, it's all just speculation. The Mystery of Hawaii The first Europeans arrived in Hawaii in 1778. Within two decades, the Kingdom of Hawaii was established, but it wouldn't be for another two centuries until Hawaii was brought into the United States of America, becoming the 50th state in 1959. Every lover of palm trees and beautiful beaches has been thankful for the inclusion of the Polynesian island group ever since. These days, it's easy to forget just how ancient Hawaii truly is. The islands are full of myths, secrets, and forgotten legends. One of the greatest mysteries, perhaps the biggest and most important of them all, involves King Kamehameha I. Depending on how old you are, you may have heard the word Kamehameha for the first time being shouted by a spiky-haired anime character on late-night TV. But Kamehameha is a real human's name, the name of the man who unified the Hawaiian Islands under one king. Kamehameha is the most important historical figure in Hawaiian history. The king died in May of 1819, and now nobody knows where he is. His bones are somewhere, presumably still in Hawaii, but where have they gone? For ancient Hawaiians, burials were extremely important events. The same can be said for many cultures around the world. But Hawaiians were particularly secretive when it came to the funeral rites of ruling chiefs and kings. First came a ceremony in which the body was prepared for the afterlife. This was pretty gruesome, even more gruesome than being a modern mortician. Using primitive tools, the flesh was removed from the bones. Once the bones were picked clean, it was time to stash them in a secret location that nobody would ever find. When night came, after King Kamehameha's bones were prepped, his trusted lieutenants, Huapili and Hualulu, took his remains to a hiding place and left them there. They most likely left the bones in a cave, or maybe they buried them somewhere near the coast. It was absolutely imperative that the bones be hidden, otherwise the king's spirit would never transition into the Hawaiian realm of the gods. It's been over 200 years now and Kamehameha's final resting place is still a secret. Many have tried to find it and there has been a lot of speculation. It's suggested his bones could be stashed somewhere near Kaloko Hono Kohau, where previous chiefs were buried, but nobody has found the king's remains. What do you think? Should we leave him alone or should people keep looking? The Dancing Plague Have you ever partied so hard that you almost danced yourself into an early grave? For the residents of Strasbourg in July 1518, they did dance themselves into the grave. The people of this medieval city came down with boogie fever and scientists have never been able to explain it. Wait, boogie fever is real? It sure is, but this particular case is known as the Dancing Plague of 1518. The city of Strasbourg was part of the Holy Roman Empire then. It all started when a woman named Frau Trophia stepped into the street and began to dance to an invisible beat. She twisted, twirled, and shook what her mama gave her, but then she didn't stop. All by herself, without a trace of music to be heard, Frau Trophia danced for almost a week. 
Then her backup dancers arrived. After a solo that would put guitar superstars to shame, three dozen other locals started dancing in the streets. Frau Trophia soon collapsed, her heart no longer beating. One by one, her backup dancers all fell to the ground, danced to death. By the time July was over, about 400 people had boogied, jived, and grooved until their hearts gave out and they died on the spot. Physicians were baffled. Locals who weren't afflicted by the gyration sensation couldn't understand what their previously normal neighbors were doing. Can you blame them? What would you think if hundreds of people took to the street and danced like maniacs for weeks at a time? The best guess medieval scientists could come up with was that they had hot blood. The only viable solution that doctors could see was that people needed to dance until their blood cooled down, or they died. To help shake the boogie fever that so many were afflicted with, a stage was constructed. Professional dancers were brought in from across the realm. The town hired a band so that people could dance to actual music. Sadly, the effort was for nothing. Dancers had strokes and heart attacks. The stage only gave dancers a place to die. The music simply gave them a lovely tune to spend their final flailing moments dancing to. August ended and a cold September began. Priests gathered to pray for the absolution of the townsfolk's souls. Everyone who was left dancing was dragged away to the mountaintop and it's believed they all died there. You might be thinking that I'm joking, right? There is no way a dancing plague killed hundreds of people. It's too ridiculous. But I'm telling you right now, it's 100% true. There are a lot of historical records to prove the event took place. It isn't even the only time it happened. Dancing plagues swept through Germany, Holland, and Switzerland in the Middle Ages. It's just that what happened in Stroudsburg was the most brutal incident of them all. Historian John Waller has traced the plague back to St. Vitus. He supposedly had the power to curse people to die from dancing fever. John doesn't think the Catholic saint legitimately cast a curse. Instead, it could be that the horrors of being alive in the 16th century, combined with the superstition surrounding St. Vitus, caused all of Stroudsburg to become hysterical. The event has been compared to what happened in Salem with the hysteria of the witch trials. There is one other possibility. It's been suggested the people of Stroudsburg accidentally ingested ergot, a toxic mold that grows on damp rye. Ergot is notorious for causing hallucinations and spasms. The whole town could have had a shared psychedelic trip and spasmed themselves into the afterlife. Ancient Artists In the Middle Ages, people believed in unicorns. If you were an ordinary peasant with a pitchfork and sickle and maybe an unlit torch at home waiting for a mob to form, you thought unicorns were real. You certainly had a good reason to believe such a mythological creature once walked the earth. In central Germany, there is a cave filled with unicorn bones. Unsurprisingly, it's called Unicorn Cave. What else would you call a cave full of unicorn bones? For centuries, humans have been returning to the dark cavern and marveling at the incredible bones scattered across the floor. It wasn't until modern times that scientists confirmed, once and for all, that the bones do not belong to real unicorns from a fairy tale. The bones are from giant deer and other huge prehistoric creatures. People didn't know any better in the Middle Ages, though. If they saw the skull of a woolly mammoth, they assumed it was the skull of a cyclops or a giant. You can't really blame them for that, right? They didn't have Google to identify all the weird skeletons that they found. Plus, people's imaginations can run wild. And that's not really a bad thing. Being imaginative is what makes people people. Speaking of people, the German cave was home to a lot more than just prehistoric deer. A recent excavation revealed the toe bone of an ancient animal that had been carved with strange symbols. When scientists from the local state government analyzed the bone, they found it was from 51,000 years ago. All those years before today, Unicorn Cave was occupied by Neanderthals, 
our mysterious ancient cousins. The toe bone, which happened to come from a giant deer, previously believed to be a unicorn, is now thought to be the oldest symbolic object ever found. According to archaeologist Dirk Leder, the meaning of the object is lost to time. It may have been used to communicate with other members of the group. It could have been used for beseeching spirits for help. There's just no way of knowing. One of the greatest mysteries that scientists are still hopeless to solve is the emergence of art and abstract thought in the human brain. It used to be that scientists assumed that human beings, as in Homo sapiens, were the first animals to gain the ability to create art from our imaginations. But with the discovery of this bone, along with other revelations that have recently come up, that might not be the case. Scientists are starting to think that Neanderthals were just as cognitively powerful as Homo sapiens. They may have been just as smart, just as creative, and just as human as we are now. The Reptilian Race Since the beginning of human civilization, cultures have been obsessed with reptilians. Tales of evil serpents and powerful snakes have pervaded just about every mythology on the planet. Could this be due to one simple fact? Are our fates as humans dictated by a race of reptilians who have been controlling us since the very beginning? It sounds crazy without evidence, so get ready for some evidence! I'm going to take you through ancient cultures who all trace their origins back to a mysterious snake, starting with the Mesoamericans. The Aztec worshipped a deity named Quetzalcoatl. His name comes from the ancient Nahuatl language spoken in Mexico. It roughly translates to mean feathered serpent. Quetzalcoatl was the mighty god of the Aztec, but his origins go back way earlier. Quetzalcoatl was worshipped as a feathered snake deity by the lost culture of Teotihuacan 2,100 years ago. 800 years before that, a serpent god was worshipped by the Olmec of Mexico's southern jungles. The earliest known depiction of the snake god in Mesoamerica is from 900 BC. It was discovered at the abandoned Olmec city of La Venta, carved onto a giant rock. For the various cultures of ancient Mexico, the feathered serpent was responsible for the creation of all humanity. The Maya called him Cuculcan, though he was essentially the same as Quetzalcoatl. They also sometimes called him the War Serpent. Now, there is perhaps no place that a serpent is more famous than in the Bible. The book of Genesis is where you can find the story of the serpent tempting Eve with the forbidden fruit. But did you know there were early groups of Christians who believed the snake was not evil? They thought the serpent was merely offering Eve knowledge from the tree of life. In the Quran, the holy book of Islam, there are stories about reptilian-like creatures known as jinn. According to the Islamic texts, these freaky beings were already on the planet before humans arrived. For the Hopi Native Americans, reptilians were a very real threat. 5,000 years ago, they told tales of a meteor shower that rained down on the world, forcing a race of lizard people to seek refuge underground. These reptilians built great cities along the Pacific coast, under places like Los Angeles. Supposedly, the lizard people still live deep underneath California to this very day. Just imagine that a few hundred feet underneath Hollywood Boulevard is a family of reptilians sitting down for a meal of earthworms or whatever it is reptilians eat. I could go on about lizards and ancient societies until the cows come home, but I still have a few mysteries I need to confound your brain with today, so I'll wrap things up with the Ubaid culture of Mesopotamia. The Ubaid culture was one of the earliest to rise in what is currently Iraq. They were technically part of Sumerian history, the earliest part, between 6500 and 4. 4100 BC, they established the earliest towns in Mesopotamia and started farming the land. They were also totally obsessed with reptilians. They made hundreds, even thousands of figurines depicting what looked like reptilian humanoids wearing space-age clothing. Could these have been modeled after a real race of highly intelligent reptiles? The Pyramids Missing Capstone in ancient Egypt, pyramids were sort of like Christmas trees. When the pyramid was finished and the stones were nice and polished and it glittered like a diamond in the desert sun, something was added to the top. Some people put a star at the top of a tree, others put an angel. The Egyptians put what is known as a pyramidion on the tops of their pyramids. A pyramidion was a capstone, the chef's kiss that really finished off an amazing building project. They were typically made from limestone, granite, or basalt. 
Often they were covered in gold or copper or even electrum plates. Electrum is an alloy most people don't even know exists. It is naturally occurring, a sort of mix of gold and silver with bits of other metals in it. It creates a greenish gold, which would have looked fantastic at the top of a pyramid. Now let's take a look at the Great Pyramid of Giza and its two handsome neighbors. Do you notice anything missing from these ancient wonders? That's right, they don't have their capstones. They are like Christmas trees without decoration and with no star at the top. So where are the capstones now? It's a mystery that might never be solved. Out of all the Egyptian pyramids, only four of their capstones are preserved inside the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Some experts have suggested the Great Pyramid of Giza never had a capstone, though that seems silly. Just look at the empty spot at the top of the pyramid and tell me there wasn't once a pyramidian there. Here is another shocking fact. The pyramid is roughly 30 feet, shorter than it originally was. This could be due to the fact the capstone was huge and fitted with something nobody knows about. What could have possibly been at the top of the pyramid that gave it an extra 30 feet of height? Maybe it was an antenna. Maybe a solid gold statue of a god. There are rumors that a giant golden throne was installed at the top of the pyramid, or that it held a huge golden sphere meant to either imitate the sun or the star Sirius, which was associated with the goddess Isis. I'm sorry to disappoint you because I only ever want to share good news, but there are no answers to this mystery. Nobody has seen the capstone of the Great Pyramid in over 4,000 years. Either it's been destroyed or it's buried somewhere in Egypt. What do you think happened to it? Let me know in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. The Vanishing of the Anasazi the sudden disappearance of the ancestral Puebloans from the Four Corners region of the United States is the greatest mystery north of Mexico, at least in the Western Hemisphere it is. The area of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado was home to a mighty civilization for centuries. Now their civilization is gone, with almost nothing left of it remaining. The ancestral Puebloans, also known as the Anasazi, began to flourish in this region around the 12th century BC. They were building homes and exploring the Grand Canyon almost 1,200 years before the rise of the Roman Empire. Some of their ruins are even better preserved than the ruins left over by Rome. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. The Anasazi produced pottery, built a road network across the American Southwest, and were master architects. Then, around the year 1250 AD, they vanished into thin air. There is no better way to explain it. They just disappeared. It was as if a fleet of spaceships came down from a distant planet and abducted every last human being for hundreds of miles. That was how quick and how decisive the Anasazi's vanishing act was. As a quick side note, it's becoming clearer that Anasazi is not a great term for this lost culture. The word emerged in the 19th century when American explorers first started to study the remnants of their civilization. They picked up the word from the local Navajo, but it doesn't mean anything good. The word Anasazi means enemy ancestors in Navajo. It has truly negative connotations, with the term being heavily rejected by modern-day Puebloans, hence the term ancestral Puebloans becoming more and more appropriate. If you ever want to see the ruins of this mysterious culture for yourself, as I have a feeling you do, there are three main spots to do it. Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, Taos Pueblo in New Mexico, and Chaco Culture National Park, also in New Mexico. These are the three places where the settlements of the ancestral Puebloans can be found in their preserved states. There are huge houses made of stone, mud, and dust. Some of the homes are up to five stories tall, making them the first known high-rises in America. There are even mud-brick apartment complexes with up to 700 rooms. Imagine how big that is, especially so long ago. As for the truth behind their vanishing, historians and archaeologists are at odds. The only thing they can agree on is that they disappeared prior to the 13th century. There may have been a natural disaster, most likely in the form of a great drought. This drought could have lasted up to 300 years, leading to unprecedented suffering. The ancestral Puebloans may have run out of food and had no choice but to flee or perish. It would have been chaos, like if suddenly every grocery store in your hometown ran out of food. Whether it was drought or a disease or a combination of everything, we still don't know. The Lydian Stater if you happen to have some change in your pocket, take a coin out and give it a good look. Who in the world decided money would be distributed as small circles of thin metal? 
Unlike some mysteries of the ancient world, this one has a reliable answer. That coin you have in your hand, or the one you're holding in your mind's eye because it's 2024 and a lot of people don't have change anymore, came from an idea around 2,700 years ago. The Lydian Satyr was the official coin of the mighty Lydian Empire. I can already feel you have questions, but bear with me a moment. The earliest of these coins were created in the 7th century BC under the rulership of King Aliates. All records point to the Lydian Stater being the first coin issued by official decree by any government. If correct, the Lydian Stater was the beginning of nearly 3,000 years of trading coins for goods and services. To answer the question you had a second ago, the Lydian Empire was the dominant force in Western Anatolia. Lydia was a massive region in what is currently Turkey, home to an Indo-European-speaking group of people. At its peak, Lydia butted up against Thrace in what is now Bulgaria, ancient home of the great Spartacus. Lydia was conquered by the Persians in 546 BC. In 133 BC, Lydia was made into the Roman province of Asia. I bet you didn't know that Asia began as a small Persian province 2,000 years ago. Bring that up at your next dinner party. Getting back to the mystery of the world's first coin, the Lydian Stater was certainly real, but finding evidence has proved troublesome. Archaeologists have had a tough time discovering them in the ruins of marketplaces throughout Lydia. This is weird because you would expect coins to be found in places where goods were exchanged. Instead, the majority of coins have been found in royal hoards. It was likely that kings and a small portion of very wealthy people were hoarding the money. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Also, a large number of coins have been recovered from ancient religious temples. You should keep in mind that although the Lydian Satyr may have been the first coin, it also may not have been the first coin. Don't you love it when that happens? There are competing theories. Some experts think that China came up with the first coins. Others believe it was an ancient society in India. It's also possible that Greece was the original inventor of money. This is one of those tedious questions that will probably never be irrefutably answered, like who invented golf? Or what came first, the chicken or the egg? Thanks for watching! What's your favorite mystery of the ancient world? Let me know in the comments below and thanks a lot for stopping by! Be sure to subscribe and stick around for more! Thanks for watching! Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed! Secret Sphinx Doors For centuries now, rumors have swirled about hidden doors and chambers, treasure hoards, and other suspected secrets hidden inside Egypt's Great Pyramids and the Sphinx of Giza. While some of these theories were probably inspired by tall tales, even archaeologists are interested in getting to the bottom of the various mysteries. The 4,500-year-old Sphinx made headlines in 2019 when a respected British historian named Bettany Hughes claimed that there are two hidden chambers beneath the monument that are worth investigating. Speaking with British papers, Hughes explained that ancient Egyptians feared and respected the Sphinx and that they believed it had supernatural powers. At the base of the giant statue near its tail, there is a small deep hole that's typically kept hidden from public view. It could lead to one of the large chambers that some researchers believe exist below the monument, according to Hughes. She believes that any tunnels beneath the Sphinx could lead to a nearby pyramid where the pharaoh Khufu is entombed. Stories about a subterranean network of tunnels and chambers beneath the Sphinx were once limited to conspiracy theorists. But the evidence has caught the attention of seasoned professionals, and their willingness to look further into these claims could prove to be a game changer. What do you think is hidden under the Sphinx? Anything? Let me know in the comments below. Mysterious Manuscripts Throughout antiquity, parchment was sometimes in short supply, so people got as much use out of it as possible. Ink was even scraped from old manuscripts using chemicals or pumice stones, clearing the way for new text. These double-layered manuscripts are known as palimpsests and their invisible lettering can teach us a lot about the ancient world. Did you know that? Palimpsests? Maybe that will come in handy for Trivial Pursuit or something. Julia Rosetto is a researcher who specializes in ancient texts. In 2016, a colleague gave her some images of a palimpsest that he was struggling to read. The visible text contained a collection of the life stories of saints written in 10th century Arabic. Beneath it were faint traces of Greek lettering. The photos were taken using a technique called multispectral imaging, 
which uses light and color to help distinguish between the two layers of writing. This didn't make the document easy to read, but it gave Julia a starting point for making the undertext more visible. She adjusted the lighting, contrast, and other elements of the pictures to hide the Arabic as much as possible and reveal the writing underneath it. Julia painstakingly identified the tiny letters, which were just three millimeters tall, and began to recognize names from classical Greek mythology like Zeus, Persephone, and Dionysus. Based on the style of the text, she guessed that it was written in Egypt during the 5th or 6th century. Her transcription turned up no matches to known texts, indicating that it was an unknown text being viewed by modern eyes for the first time. And it's just one of hundreds of manuscripts that researchers have deciphered in recent years, thanks to technology that enables them to peer below the surface in ways that only recently became possible. What other hidden knowledge do you think can be revealed like this? Let me know your theories in the comments! Vault B Sri Padmanabha Swami is one of the most revered temples dedicated to the Hindu deity Mahavishnu. It was built during the 6th century in what is now the Indian state of Kerala, and it is famous for its extravagance and gilded decor. In 2011, retired Indian police services officer Sundarajan petitioned the Supreme Court for an audit of the temple's treasury. He suspected that the temple was in possession of unaccounted wealth, and the court appointed a seven-member committee to investigate. Inside the temple, the committee discovered six large unopened vaults, or kalaras, with iron doors. They labeled the vaults A through F, and managed to open all except for the innermost chamber, Vault B. The other vaults contained diamonds, gemstones, necklaces, weapons, gold coins, and other treasures with a jaw-dropping estimated value of one trillion dollars. Vault B remains locked, despite the committee's best efforts to open it, leading many to believe that it's cursed. The door can supposedly only be opened by a high-ranking priest known as a sadhus, who knows a special chant called the Garuda Mantra. But no modern priests know the chant, so there are evidently no plans to enter the vault, unless they want to destroy the whole thing. According to legend, a group of thieves tried to access the vault during the 1930s and were attacked by venomous snakes. The belief that opening the vault would bring bad luck became even stronger when the man who petitioned for the audit suddenly died. Auditor General Vinod Rai challenged these superstitions in 2015 when he claimed that Vault B had been opened numerous times since the 1990s without incident, but it remains closed in accordance with the wishes of devotees, temple officials, and the royal family. What do you think about this mysterious door? Let me know in the comments below! A Forgotten Port City on July 21, 365 AD, a massive tsunami struck the coast of what is now Tunisia, wiping out most of the Roman port city of Neapolis. A soldier and historian named Amian Marcelin wrote about the disaster, which also wreaked havoc on the Greek island of Crete as well as the city of Alexandria in Egypt. This is one of very few mentionings of Neapolis in ancient texts. During the Third Punic War, which lasted from 149 to 146 BC, the people of Neapolis sided with Carthage rather than Rome. The Romans won the war and took control of the city, and its conspicuous absence from historical records suggests that the citizens were punished for having supported the enemy. It left modern experts with little to learn from, especially since some of the settlement's ruins are buried beneath the modern city of Nabul. Archaeologists began searching for submerged ruins in 2010, but it wasn't until 2013 that they finally found the section of Neapolis that had been sucked beneath the waves. The discovery came after a storm ravaged the seabed, revealing man-made stone structures including street signs and monuments. The ruins revealed previously unknown details about Neapolis and its role within the empire as a major trading hub. Over 100 tanks that were used for making a fish-based fermented condiment called garum were found at the site indicating that the city specialized in the production of the popular Roman delicacy. Based on this alone, Neapolis was undoubtedly one of the empire's wealthiest and most important commercial centers, and yet so little is known about it, since it was basically erased from the history books. What's in the Taj Mahal basement? Shah Jahan was the fifth Mughal emperor of India, who ruled from 1628 to 1658. He brought the empire to its peak, 
ushering in the golden age of Mughal architecture with the commission of breathtaking monuments. His most famous building, the Taj Mahal, sits on a 42-acre plot in the modern-day Indian city of Agra. It was built in 1632 in honor of Shah Jahan's beloved wife, Mumtaz, and is the couple's final resting place. Their tombs are kept in a locked chamber in the basement and are typically off-limits to visitors. There are two replica burials on public display on the building's first floor. Visitors had a rare opportunity to see the real tombs firsthand on Shah Jahan's birthday in 2018. They were disappointed to find the burials in a deplorable state, blackened from years of neglect, and called on the government to restore them and make them accessible to the public. Allowing visitors to see the graves on a regular basis would hold the authorities to higher standards when it came to maintaining them. Officials were cryptic in their response to the outrage, but this is nothing new. In fact, people have voiced numerous concerns about the Taj Mahal, only to be more or less stonewalled by the government. Many suspect that the monument was built on the site of a former Hindu temple, and that the basement contains Hindu artifacts and artwork. In 2019, Parliament member Subramanian Swami claimed that these objects had been removed from the property years earlier. He also said that he had documentation proving that the Taj Mahal was built on stolen Hindu property. It's also believed that there may be as many as 22 secret rooms beneath the building, but if they do exist, only a privileged few know about them or what's inside, and these select few are keeping silent. Muslim Influence in Spain The early Middle Ages were marked by a series of tumultuous religious conflicts known as the Crusades. I'm sure you've heard of that already. During that period, the Iberian Peninsula served as a frontier between warring Muslims and Christians. Muslim rulers conquered the region during the early 8th century. They secured their victory by offering generous surrender terms to the population, who were fed up with the harsh conditions they endured under previous leadership. In 756 AD, the new leader, Amir Abd al-Rahman, established the Andalusian Umayyad dynasty. He delivered a newfound stability to the region that its residents had never experienced. The emperor strengthened the region by unifying the various Islamic groups that had conquered Spain, bringing an unprecedented level of power to Muslim rule. Over the next several hundred years, the area became home to one of the greatest Islamic civilizations of all time. Much of the Iberian Peninsula's rich Muslim history was forgotten after the Catholic kings Isabella and Ferdinand retook the region in 1492 and erased nearly every trace of the cultures they conquered. In 2020, archaeologists discovered an Islamic cemetery in the Spanish town of Tauste, consisting of 433 graves dating between the 8th and 12th centuries. The dead were laid to rest according to traditional Muslim burial customs. It's clear, based on the evidence, that there was a strong Islamic presence in the town for several centuries. In fact, the archaeologists who discovered the cemetery believe that there are more burials yet to be found, but the search is slow going due to limited funding. There is no mention of a Muslim population in local accounts, which proves that historical narratives are not always accurate, and they sometimes leave out major details about the past. This is why it's important to let archaeological evidence speak for itself, especially when it comes to filling in any gaps that were conveniently left out. Maleus Maleficarum Around 50,000 suspected witches were executed throughout Europe between 1580 and 1630, and an astounding 80% of them were women. While the deadly persecutions were at least partially rooted in superstition, mainstream Christianity had condemned the belief in witches by then, writing it off as a pagan myth. Yet something managed to revive it on a massive scale, leading to widespread torture and execution. This sudden uptick in witch paranoia may have been encouraged by a book called The Maleus Maleficarum, or The Hammer of Witches. It's the handiwork of a Catholic clergyman named Heinrich Kramer, who encouraged leaders to treat witchcraft as a crime, torture suspects into confessing, and impose the death penalty on those who were considered beyond hope. The book was first published in the German city of Speyer in 1486. Its influence spread like wildfire, despite the fact that high-ranking members of the Inquisition discouraged its use, arguing that it encouraged unethical and illegal treatment and ran contrary to Catholic doctrines of demonology. Royal courts of the Renaissance treated the Hammer of Witches as a guidebook on how to treat suspects, 
and these methods became increasingly brutal during the 16th and 17th centuries. Kramer certainly wasn't the first writer to encourage witch hysteria in medieval Europe, but he was arguably the most influential. Before he wrote the book, he had tried unsuccessfully to prosecute alleged witches in the city of Innsbruck. A local bishop asked Kramer to leave the area after noticing the man's obsession with an accused witch's sexual habits. The suspect was acquitted. Many believe that Kramer wrote the Maleus Maleficarum to get revenge on those involved in his failed witch trial. After all, even if he believed that witchcraft was real, his motives seemed personal, and it led to the unspeakable suffering and deaths of tens of thousands of innocent victims. King Solomon's Treasure Israel's third king, Solomon, reigned from 965 to 925 BC. He was one of the richest men of all time, profiting immensely from the gold trade and other commerce, as well as taxes and tributes that he collected from his subjects. The empire prospered under Solomon's leadership, which saw the construction of magnificent palaces and fortresses. According to the Bible, the king accumulated vast treasure, including more than 500 tons of pure gold, a 3,000-year-old gilded box, musical instruments made from gold, precious stones, ornaments from the Garden of Eden, and the famed gilded chest known as the Ark of the Covenant. These items vanished when the Babylonians sacked Solomon's temple in 597 and 586 BC. Countless people have searched for the items, including both experts and civilians, but not a single trace of the items in the collection has turned up. A story written during biblical times called The Treatise of the Vessels claims that Solomon's treasures were stashed in various hiding places throughout the Middle East, but the tale is a fictional piece that was written merely for entertainment, according to Professor James Davila, who translated the text in 2014. Archaeologists can't seem to agree on whether the treasure was stolen, hidden, or destroyed, or if it ever existed in the first place. British historian Ralph Ellis spent 20 years researching the topic and concluded that the story was misinterpreted. He believes that Solomon was an Egyptian pharaoh and that his alleged hidden wealth never existed. Ellis conceded that there is likely a morsel of truth to the tale and that Solomon probably was incredibly rich. But it's hard to believe that the king stashed his riches and not a single item has ever been found, especially considering how thoroughly people have searched for the goods. The Mummy Cold Case The Federal Bureau of Investigation recently cracked its coldest case ever, dating back 4,000 years to ancient Egypt. The FBI extracted DNA from a mummy's head and was able to identify the long-dead individual. The mystery began in 1915, when a team of American archaeologists discovered the severed mummy head in the Egyptian necropolis of Deir el Bersha. The head was sent back to America and stored at Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. But no one was ever able to figure out just who the head belonged to. It had been separated from its body and was found in a tomb that may not have been its own. The head was uncovered inside the tomb of Jehutignacht and his wife, a governor from the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. But in the 4,000 years since the tomb was built, it was robbed and ransacked numerous times. The bodies within were tampered with, and the burial site was almost burned down. To make matters even more confusing, the head had many of its most important bones removed. Things like the cheekbones and part of the jaw hinge were taken after death. It was part of an ancient ritual to allow the dead person to eat and drink in the afterlife. In 2016, a piece of tooth was brought to forensic scientist Dr. Odile Laurel with the FBI. She analyzed the DNA inside the tooth and confirmed that the head belonged to a man and that it was most likely Governor Jehutinakt. There was a big fuss for over a century about who the head belonged to, and in the end, it was the same guy who owned the tomb. The Queen's Chamber Deep inside the Great Pyramid of Giza, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu, there is a maze of tunnels and chambers. The entrance to the pyramid is located near the ground level. Through the entrance, which goes diagonally down into the structure, there then comes a fork. The tunnel splits into a descending passageway and an ascending passageway. If you take the passageway leading up, you wind up in the Grand Gallery. This is a super passage that goes to the very heart of the pyramid, 
to its core where a mysterious chamber sits seemingly unused. It's called the Queen's Chamber, and nobody is really sure what it was used for. The chamber was discovered in 1872, hidden behind a solid wall of brick. For whatever reason, it had been sealed away as a secret inside the pyramid. When researchers entered the room, much to their disappointment, they didn't find anything. The room is finished with smooth limestone blocks and has a gabled ceiling. The masonry is exquisite, and yet there seems to have been no reason for it. It was empty except for a small copper object, a chunk of wood, and a random hook. There's been a lot of speculation over what was contained within the Queen's Chamber. Some say it was once full of treasure, but that it was pillaged over time and the door was sealed. Others believe the room, due to its location underneath the King's Chamber, was used as a spiritual tomb for the soul of the King. While King Khufu's body was kept in one room, his eternal soul was put to rest in another. King Tutankhamun Prior to 1922, no one believed the tomb of King Tutankhamun would ever be found. Back then, the boy king who ruled for less than a decade, 3,000 years ago, was more of a myth than a reality. The general agreement among Egyptologists was that every tomb in the Valley of the Kings had already either been discovered or looted and destroyed. It came as a huge shock when King Tut's tomb was finally unearthed under over 150,000 tons of rock. It was extremely well hidden and would likely never have been found if archaeologists weren't actively searching for it. King Tut would probably still be resting in his grave right now. Even though the tomb was found filled with more treasure than you could carry out in a wheelbarrow, it had been broken into before. One of the little-known facts about King Tut's tomb is that it had been robbed twice. It happened almost immediately after the burial. Looters had breached the door at the base of the stairs, taking a handful of smaller objects and then fled. Ancient officials then sealed the opening, only to have it broken into a second time and more small objects stolen. The biggest mystery is trying to figure out when exactly the tomb became lost. Clearly, people knew about it in the years after Tutankhamun's death, but then, at some point in time, the tomb was forgotten, covered in sand, and buried under thousands of tons of rock. The Secret Entrance The Great Pyramid of Giza was built around the year 2500 BC as a tomb for King Khufu. If true, that makes the pyramid little more than a gigantic tombstone, and yet it's also filled with strange secrets. Some believe there are mysterious tunnels underneath the Giza pyramids leading to unknown locations. Some think the three pyramids worked as huge batteries for charging alien spaceships. There is even a theory about a secret entrance hiding near the top of Khufu's pyramid that leads down into secret and undiscovered chambers. Recently, one of the secrets of the pyramid was revealed. An international team of researchers with something called the Scan Pyramids Project identified an empty space. They used special, non-invasive scanning technology to look inside the structure. That was when they found a void hiding within the pyramid that doesn't seem to be attached to any known passage or chamber. This mysterious void is way above the Queen's Chamber and next to the King's Chamber. However, there appears to be no passage leading to it and no way to get to it except for digging through with a jackhammer. It could be that this void was once reachable by a secret passageway, but that secret entrance has since been sealed. Nobody knows if there are bodies inside the chamber or if there was an engineering accident. All we know now is that there is a hole inside the pyramid and we have no way of looking inside it. Caves under Giza British explorer Andrew Collins believes there is a system of caves, tunnels, and hidden chambers hiding underneath the pyramids of Giza. Andrew claims that beneath the Giza Plateau is a lost underworld of the pharaohs, a world currently inhabited by colonies of bats and venomous spiders. Andrew claims that he uncovered the entrance to this creepy underworld after looking through the memoirs of British Consul General Henry Salt. Henry investigated an underground system beneath Giza in 1817 while traveling with the famous Italian explorer Giovanni Caviglia. Andrew studied the notes taken by the explorer 
and then found his own way into the underground complex through a secret, unmarked tomb west of the Great Pyramid. If what Andrew says is correct, the entrance to an entire subterranean system is hiding at the back of a cobweb-filled catacomb. A crack in the rock at the back of the tomb leads into a natural cave, which then opens into an underworld. However, there are a lot of professionals who believe Andrew is making his story up. Zahi Hawass, the chief of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, dismissed the discovery as nonsense. He says there are no new discoveries to be made at Giza. Gabal El Haridi Archaeologists have just made some amazing discoveries at the Egyptian site of Gabal El Haridi. Researchers found the remains of an old watchtower and an impressive 85 new tombs. The watchtower is a unique piece of ancient architecture. When it comes to discoveries in Egypt, people tend to focus on the tombs, the mummies, and the pyramids. But Egypt has lots of amazing architecture as well, just as impressive as the many wonders found throughout the old Roman Empire. This tower is an excellent example of that. The tower was a powerful fortification built beside the Nile River during the reign of Ptolemy III. He was the third ruler of the Ptolemaic dynasty after the death of Alexander the Great, ruling Egypt between 246 and 222 BC. The tower was used specifically for guarding traffic moving up and down the Nile and collecting taxes. Think of it like the toll booth on a bridge, forcing everyone who passed to pay a little bit of money to the government. Then there were the 85 tombs, each of which was carved into the side of a mountain. Some of the tombs were reserved for workers, and others were more complex, with multiple levels and various chambers. At least 30 of the chambers still had their death certificates preserved in stone. These ancient certificates detail the name of the deceased, their age, their place in society, and even the names of their parents. Forgotten Rituals Berenike was a Greco-Roman seaport built on the coast of Egypt's eastern desert. A recent archaeological dig here revealed a religious complex from the late Roman period between the 4th and 6th centuries AD. This was in the dying years of Egypt, when ancient Egypt was a thing of the past and the nation was little more than a fractured state being fought over by multiple powers. The religious complex was excavated by researchers with the University of Delaware. Around the time the temple was built, the nomadic group known as the Blemies was trying to hold control over the region. These people had come up from Nubia and were hoping to secure a small piece of Egypt for themselves. The complex was already there, but the Blemies adapted it to their own belief system. What archaeologists found was a traditional Egyptian temple used by an invading force of Nubians for their own mysterious rituals. The team found 15 dead falcons inside the shrine, most of them decapitated. They also found the remains of eggs that had been buried within the temple. Then there's the mysterious stone slab with an inscription that reads, it is improper to boil a head in here. In other words, nobody was allowed to boil animal heads inside the temple. So what were the falcons for? It's believed that Blemies had combined local Egyptian beliefs with their own and that there was heavy worship of the god Khonsu here, the moon god often depicted as a falcon. Newly found tombs More tombs have been discovered at the great necropolis of Saqqara, south of Cairo. That shouldn't come as a big surprise considering how many new tombs are being discovered here all the time. In this instance, five new stone burials have been found dating from between 2700 and 2055 BC. They were uncovered near the less popular Pyramid of Merenre, which stands just over 150 feet tall and was built during the 6th dynasty. The five tombs are so wonderfully decorated that they are still full of color. Researchers say they likely belonged to top officials in the ancient Egyptian government. At least two of the tombs belong to women, with one of them being a priest of Hathor, the Egyptian goddess of fertility and love. Her name was Peti, and she must have been a very important person in society. She wasn't just a priest, she had some kind of influence within the government. It's also shocking to see that women could be priests almost 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. Lost Egyptian Sun Temples Archaeologists carrying out an excavation in Abu Sir, near both Cairo and Saqqara, recently discovered the ruins of an ancient temple. 
This temple is believed to be one of the four lost sun temples from Egyptian legend. The site of Abu Sir isn't quite as well known as many others in ancient Egypt, but it is hugely important. It's an necropolis from the Old Kingdom that served as a primary cemetery for the previous Egyptian capital of Memphis. So far, archaeologists have identified 14 royal pyramids, tombs from the 25th century BC, and now a mysterious temple. It was researchers from Poland and Italy who came across the newest discovery. They were excavating the temple of Pharaoh Nayusera Ini from the 5th dynasty when they found the remains of a mud brick building. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities believes the mud brick building is the ruin of a sun temple. The sun temples were constructed during the 5th dynasty of the Old Kingdom, built across Egypt by six different pharaohs. Each pharaoh built their own glorious sun temple for the worship of the sun god Ra. As of right now, only two of the temples have been found. This newest discovery at Abu Sir could be the third, meaning there are only three left hiding somewhere in Egypt. However, it's in such a disastrous state, archaeologists haven't been able to confirm it as one of the legendary temples. Ancient Mummification Researchers have just made a shocking discovery regarding the history of mummies. It turns out the science of mummification in Egypt is 1,000 years older than anyone previously believed. The discovery came in 2019 when the mummy of a high-ranking aristocrat was found in Egypt. The individual wasn't that important, but his mummification was. He is one of the oldest Egyptian mummies ever found, dating back to over 4,700 years ago. He was found wrapped in woven linen and smeared with fine resins. The linen and resin were hugely important because these particular materials were supposedly not used to make mummies until about 3,700 years ago. Up until now, researchers believed Old Kingdom mummification was extremely simple. There would be basic desiccation, no removal of the brain, only a couple of internal organs taken out, and very little detail paid to the exterior of the mummy. But this newest mummy was totally unique covered in resins and textiles as if it had been made 1,000 years later. The person inside the wrappings was named Kui, and he was found buried in Saqqara. With this new information, archaeologists believe history books about the mummification process will need to be rewritten. Thanks for watching! What's your favorite part about ancient Egypt? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!